Good morning, and thank you for joining us for the 2021 Skills Workshop webinar series. I'm Holly De Silva, Executive Director of the Biomedical Science Careers Program, better known as BSCP. The Skills Workshop webinar series was created to address the needs of underrepresented minority and disadvantaged high school and college students by providing concrete information on the skills needed for success in their academic careers. Today is the fourth webinar in our eight-part series. This session will focus on questions parents and caregivers might have about their students' academic journey. Future session topics include next week's Community College Pathways, which we highly encourage you or your high school student to attend if you're interested in understanding the options available when attending community co a community college program. We'll also have sessions on interviewing skills, tips for resume and cover letter, and internships and summer opportunities. The series will culminate with an internship fair, which is a new addition this year on October 30th. This program is co-sponsored by the Harvard Medical School Office for Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Partnership and the Biomedical Science Careers Program. Before we get started, a few disclaimer and housekeeping items. All lines have been muted and the chat function is disabled. Please communicate with the moderator and panelists using the Q&A tab in your webinar panel. This recording, webinar recording, will be available on both the BSCP and Harvard Medical School DICP websites. And each participant will receive a supplemental packet of information with over 50 documents emailed to the address with which you registered for the session today by the end of the day on Monday. Please take the poll questions at the end. So it's very short and we could really use your feedback in planning um, for future programs. And now it is my pleasure to introduce you to our moderator this morning, Dr. Judith Sanford Harris. Dr. Sanford Harris is a retired higher ed administrator and public school counselor and a longtime BSCP volunteer. We're so happy to have her here to moderate the session today. Judith. Thank you, Holly. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here with you this morning. Um, we have a wonderful jam-packed webinar for you today with loads of information. And it's probably going to be overwhelming, but the good thing is, as Holly said, it's all being recorded and will be available to you in the future. And also, as she mentioned, you're going to receive 50, yes, five zero documents that cover much of the information we're going to cover today, plus a lot more. So if you don't get everything down in your notes today, don't worry. A lot of that information will be covered and explained in real detail in those documents you're going to receive. Just as a, a kind of a baseline, as a beginning, let me say, as someone who worked in higher ed for 30 years and who had two daughters go to college and I went to college myself, the process is overwhelming and it can be scary and that's okay, you, you're not alone at all. There's loads of information, there are thousands of colleges. As an example, here in Massachusetts alone, um, in one document I looked at and I, I couldn't find the date it was published probably a couple of years old. So there might have been a few mergers and changes, but in that document, it said that there were 114 colleges and universities in Massachusetts alone. There are 35, or there were 35 colleges and universities in Boston, just in Boston. So for those of you living in Massachusetts, you have a wealth of information and a, quite a few colleges available to you and your children to look at. And that, that's why it's so overwhelming. That's only part of it. Um, as an example, there are community colleges and Holly mentioned that there's a webinar coming up about community colleges. I would encourage you to, to watch that webinar, even if you're not quite sure that that's what your son or daughter would be interested in. Um, because they offer so many different kinds of programs. They offer introductory programs, what some people might call the first two years of a college degree or a four-year degree. Um, and other programs they offer are just what you need to enter a particular field, like being an, uh, what some people call an x-ray technician as an example. And you might only need two years of education beyond high school for that. They also typically don't have dorms. Their, their campuses don't have all the grass and the, and the you know, fancy buildings necessarily. 
So tuition isn't as high. Um, it means that, that a student would typically commute, drive back and forth. They have day and evening classes and online classes and so on. So lots of different options in community colleges. Um, then there are the four-year colleges that I, a lot of people call them four-year that offer a bachelor's degree or some call it a BA or a BS or there are a number of letters that might follow the name of that degree. Um, and those are the, what I would call the traditional degree programs. Um, some prepare students to go to work immediately after. For others, it's still just the beginning and you still need to go to a graduate school, um, a master's program, a, a degree beyond what is a traditional college. Um, for law, for medicine, for dentistry, for um, lots of different fields. So there's lots of information. We'll cover some of that today. We can't cover it all, um, but we hope you know that we'll try to answer your questions as best we can. We have wonderful panelists here today and I'll introduce them to you now. We have Mr. Stephen Abbott, Associate Director of Admissions and Coordinator of Native and Indigenous Outreach at Dartmouth. We have Mr. Jonathan Hughes, Associate Director of College Planning and Education at the Massachusetts Educational Financing Authority, also known as MIFA. We have Ms. Talia Jimenez, an Education Advisor at the Mass Edco Education and Career Planning Center in Boston. And last but not least, Ms. Wendy Lindsay, Senior Director of the Regional Student Program at the New England Board of Higher Education. We received a number of questions in advance. And so each of our speakers will take about 10 minutes to try to answer some of those questions. And um, we'll go in alphabetical order, Abbott first. So Stephen, could you please start and address some of the questions that, that you think um, you can handle best? Thank you. Sure. Uh, good morning, everybody. And thank you, Dr. Sanford Harris. And thanks to you for uh, having us all here today. Thanks very much to the audience for, for coming out. And um, as Dr. Sanford Harris said, it's you know obviously a lot of information. It can be a little bit overwhelming. So uh, it is pretty much impossible to cover everything, but hopefully what we can provide for you is a little bit of a roadmap and a little bit of basic information to help pull the curtain back on some of this process. And in many ways, as overwhelming and complicated as it can be, um, at its core, it is still in many ways a fairly simple, simple process. And hopefully we can communicate a little bit of that. So um, just to start off with one of the questions that was shared ahead of time was, um, how do I get my child accepted into college of their, their dreams? Should we meet, be meeting with our high school guidance counselor? Uh, those kinds of things. And one of the things I always like to start with is actually something that I borrow from a colleague of mine who is the director of, um, or excuse me, the Dean of Admissions at University of New Hampshire uh, down in Durham. And when we do programs like this, particularly with families, he will often start by asking the simple question, is getting into college easy or hard? And you can usually hear a collective seismic groan from the audience and it is hard. And he says, actually, that's not true. So, um, so picking up on what Dr. Sanford Harris said about the number of colleges and universities out there, uh, if you add up the number of accredited two-year and four-year schools just within the United States alone, it's almost 4,000 colleges and universities. Um, there is just tremendous, tremendous diversity and tremendous offerings out there. And only about and about 90% of them are either open enrollment or they will tell you very clearly if you have this GPA or whatever their requirements might be, what it takes to get into those institutions. It's only about 10% that fall into the category of what we call selective or highly selective institutions. And yet that occupies a lot of the bandwidth of the conversations that you hear about colleges um, because those are the more uh, complicated applications oftentimes. Those are the institutions that are sometimes the well-known names. They might be the flagship state school. They might be the Ivy League and Ivy Plus schools. They might be the better known, you know, selective liberal arts institutions, those kinds of things. But it is important to remember that, um, you know, that's only about 10% of the colleges and universities out there. And so one of the things, the first things that I really encourage people to think about 
to maintain sanity during this process is really not to try to focus on only one school, particularly if your student is looking at those more selective institutions. Um, so curating a good list of institutions is really, really key. So having more than one option that someone's considering and particularly incorporating into that what oftentimes people will refer to as an anchor school or someplace where you're pretty, pretty much guaranteed to get in. And so, um, the really, really important process or the most important part of this process, and if we take nothing else out of today, I hope this will kind of resonate loud and clear is there's no such thing as the best school. There's only the best school for your student. This is really all about fit. And so all about, the, you know, all those almost 4000 colleges and universities, it's kind of considering in terms of whatever factors might be most important, the academics, um, the affordability, the location, the size the individuality of attention, all those different kinds of things, what factors are going to make the best fit uh, for, your, for your student. So curating a list of institutions with one school that you're fairly, you know, uh, fairly confident you're going to, to get into or guaranteed to get into uh, will leave you with a lot of great options um, in, the, in the process as you go through. So I think for parents, for families, being involved, being supportive is wonderful, but also it's really important to allow the student to guide this process because it is a very, very individualized one and it's a very personal one. And so another similar question was, how can I help my child prepare for the admissions process and enhance my own understanding of the college application process? And one of the most important things that I encourage people to do really is to try to tune out the noise, tune out the static. There is so much pressure and where these things get so complicated is because everybody thinks they have a secret. So everybody that you talk to, every teacher, every private counselor, every website, every poll, every magazine article, Uncle Joe and the mailman all can tell you like why the why, way you get into a college is this way pretty much any sentence that begins that way, you can ignore the rest of the sentence, okay? Um, the only way to make that sentence true is by saying the way you get into college is apply, okay? That's really the, the bottom line. Beyond that, there are no secrets. And a lot of times people get really caught up in this idea that there's something that we don't know. There's something that um, somebody has figured out and all that kind of stuff. The reality is most of these selective schools, um, as the ones that we're talking about, uh, use what we call a holistic process. So our goal is not just to look at what is your GPA, what is your SAT score, add those two together, divide by two, and you get in, you don't get in. What's happening in most of these institutions, we, we are building a community. So we really wanna know everything about the student. So um, the, the, the application is really a form of storytelling. It's the opportunity for your student to put themselves out there in a real and authentic way. So we had last year at Dartmouth, we had um, over 28,000 applications. Our class is 1,100 students. So if there was only one type of student that was getting in, that community in this place would be really, really boring. Of all those 1,100 students who ultimately came in as first year students this year, everybody had a different story. Everybody had a different background. There are no rights, there are no wrongs. What we're really trying to do is build a community of students. So the more you can encourage your student to be authentic, to not worry about what is it the colleges wanna hear. I always feel like that's such a dangerous sentence in this process or a dangerous idea is, <clears throat> because I hear people saying this all the time, oh, I don't think colleges wanna hear about that. Colleges wanna hear about who you are and what's important to you. And that's really the end of it. So um, the more that you can encourage people to be, be authentic, the more you can tune out that noise, uh, the better off and the more sane this whole process is really gonna be uh, for your student. I often uh, joke with students, but it's actually kind of true that there are probably two points in your life where you will receive more unsolicited advice than any other. One is if you decide to get married and the other is if you decide to go to college. And in both cases, about 90% of what you're told will be well-intentioned, but completely wrong. So um, and it is because like marriage, this is a very personal process. It's a very individualized process. And it's one that you will figure out as you, as you go along. So it is really important, again, to have that authenticity, to have that personal, um, that personal storytelling in the application process. That is really what we're looking for. And as a brief aside, one, one place where I see particularly a lot of our 
first gen students, a lot of our low income students, um, many students of color really selling themselves short is that they don't talk about the things that they do outside of school. And it's really important to understand that the things that you do with your family, the things that you do with your community, the things that you might do with a faith community, all of those things matter tremendously and often are the greatest sources of differentiation as an applicant than we see in colleges that scholarship agencies will see. So it's really, really important to focus on that. Again, that whole aspect, it's not just about the things that people do in school. Just as a couple of other quick bullet point um, suggestions, number one is don't pay for resources. There are tremendous, tremendous free resources out there. I'll be happy to share a couple of great starter websites um, in the chat as we move forward, uh, put out by the College Board. They can help with everything from college searches to scholarship searches, et cetera. But um, the minute that you get on the internet, there are all kinds of things that will come your way about, you know, send us $100 and we'll help you find the college of your dreams or, you know, uh, sign up now and we'll fill out the FAFSA form for you and all these kinds of things that we'll talk more about as I know as we get into financial aid. Um, but most of the resources that you can access out there are free and are very, very good. Um, Number two, and we'll spend a lot more time talking about this, so I don't want to jump the jump the gun, but is understanding the role that financial aid uh, plays. So a lot of times uh, people will look away from institutions that look really expensive on paper uh, because they think there's just no way that we can afford that. Um, and the reality is oftentimes the more expensive schools have more aid to give. So a lot of the older institutions, some of the well-known institutions, the places with really deep pockets offer tremendous, tremendous financial aid. And so oftentimes it can actually be less expensive to go to a more expensive school, which makes absolutely no sense whatsoever, but is a reality in many, um, many cases. And also one other point that I think is often confusing for particularly a lot of um, first generation families is that um, your choice of college and your choice of college major does not necessarily equal your career. Anytime you get a group of people together who are college graduates and you ask how many people are in a profession right now that you're under is directly tied to your undergraduate major, usually less than half the people in the room will raise their hands. And one of the things that I think, even as someone who has been in higher education for 25 years and watched so much of this unfold, um, that's very, very difficult to understand or really internalize um, is that the professional arena is changing so quickly right now. Um, and for students who are in high school right now, depending on whose statistics you believe, somewhere around 50% of them will be going into jobs that don't even exist at this moment. That's how fast things are changing with technology, with communication, with all of these different kinds of things. And so often it is the skills that students are getting rather than the material that they are learning that is gonna determine their professional path. So it's just one, uh, one additional thing uh, to bear in mind. And lastly, I just wanted to, um, there was a couple of questions specifically about being a first generation student, being a first generation family, are we at a disadvantage? Um, and the answer is no, you're not, but it is easy sometimes to feel that way. Um, it is important to understand many different institutions will define first generation in different language. Uh, so it is something to look at as you're looking at different scholarships and different colleges. Um, but again, you know, allowing your student to guide the process, being helpful, being supportive, but letting them kind of uh, blaze the trail that they, they want is very helpful. Seeking out the resources that are out there, including many of the uh, types of organizations you're going to hear from today. Uh, there's a lot of great community-based organizations and other resources out there that can help you uh, in this process, as well as things at the individual colleges and universities that can help you both with the admissions and financial aid process, um, as well as ultimately helping and being a resource for your student. And um, I'll introduce a term that I know will um, talk about, um, or excuse me, I just want to say that a, a lot of colleges will be seeking you out as a first generation student. So it is very important to ask questions and push back a little bit, um, find out what are the resources there, find out what the graduation rates at those institutions are, um, because this is, you know, the schools have to look good to you, in addition to you trying to look good in, you know, your application process. So I hope that's a hopeful, helpful way to, to start things off and we'll turn things over. Um, and I know there's a lot more, a lot more ground to cover. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very helpful. I think I'm going to change up the order a little. I'm going to ask um, Ms. Jimenez to go next um, to talk a little bit more about how to find the right college. As, yeah. as uh, Mr. Abbott said, there are so many in-state, out-of-state, large, small, mm -hmm. urban, suburban, with dorms, without um, 
with lots of financial aid, with little or no money, um, with loads of degrees or just a few specialized degrees. So how do you figure it out? Yeah, thank you, Judith. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Tilia Jimenez. Um, thank you again for inviting me here today. Um, like Stephen said, it it definitely could be an overwhelming and perhaps tedious process um, that a student and families could go through during um, you know, this transition of a student's life. Um, but hopefully the questions that I, I'll answer today will make it a little easier on your part. Um, but again, you know, we have the Q&A box. So if you do have any additional questions, feel free um, to write those out. Uh, so one of the questions that uh, I got was, is it possible to get a timeline of uh, what we should be doing while in high school to make getting into college easier? Um, so yeah, there, I guess you could say there is a timeline that you could start looking into for a student. Obviously, every student will be a little different. So um, depending on where you start, you know, I think you should take into consideration um, what, you know, key aspects of that timeline you want to focus on um, and how that will, you know, get in time for that moment of applying to schools. So when I'm thinking of a timeline, really, I'm thinking of, um, you know, maybe if you're starting freshman or sophomore year, um, I guess that would be, you know, a good time for students to look into perhaps hobbies that they are interested in, or maybe some sort of um, volunteer work, whether it's, you know, within their school, outside of their school. So that could be, you know, maybe their, um, their church a charity, um, maybe their own work experience, um, you know, stuff like that. Um, for students to get involved with and also remembering, you know, that's obviously something they care about um, could be very, you know, essential later on in the future. Um, also, you know, throughout the beginning of, you know, that timeline from freshman, sophomore, um, you know, making sure the students academics are, you know, doing all right, you know, if a student is struggling, for example, you know, try to seek out those resources, whether it's inside your school, or um, outside your school, and definitely, I encourage to look up those free resources, like Stephen had mentioned. Um, so if you're thinking of, for example, like SAT prep, um, definitely look into, you know, maybe some free courses. One that I can think of is Let's Get Ready in Boston. Um, if you're not familiar with that program, um, I know that's been a useful resource for students that I've worked with in the past, um, along with maybe like Khan Academy, which is an online program as well. Um, and then if we're diving into more of the later timeline, so junior and senior year, um, I believe that's more of the, pro the, the start of the process of, you know, applying what the student has done before and, you know, bringing that to where they can see themselves in college. So, um, you know, that that portion of the timeline showing students, you know, or at least students will demonstrate an interest in what college they would like to be interested in or applying to. So perhaps that could be maybe, um, you know, attending a college fair, whether it's in person or virtually, um, maybe opting in an interview with the admissions counselor at the school, or, you know, engaging in some virtual um, sessions with them, um, kind of just showing, you know, the, the school itself that you are um, interested that of their um, university. Um, and then along, obviously, the last part would be more of like the application process. So um, making sure students, you know, are starting early with that process um, in that um, in that timeline. Um, so whether it's requesting letters of recommendation, um, either at the beginning or like towards the end of your junior year, or maybe at the beginning of your senior year, um, perhaps starting your college essay um, towards, you know, the start of your senior year. Um, and then also, if you're looking more in the financial aspect, perhaps, you know, starting your FAFSA um, early on, um, that's something to consider as well. I'm sure we'll dive into a little bit, a little more later on in this presentation. Um, but that's kind of what I see it as in terms of a timeline. Um, again, every student can be a little different so maybe some students might start a little later which is totally okay um, but you know as long as you advocate that um, you know you were you were you were interested in that whatever hobby or um, 
you know, club that you were doing or, you know, making sure you get those applications in on time, fast applications on time, you know, just making sure you reach that um, deadline of when applications are due. Um, so that's how I kind of see it at the timeline. Um, and then additionally, um, I know I saw a question about um, how can we navigate the application process during COVID-19, especially without standardized tests. Um, so like I mentioned, um, you know, navigating the application process can be very tedious because every school might be a little different from one another. Um, I guess my best opinion about it is really, you know, just keeping up with the school's info, whether it's on their website or they have open houses or virtual info sessions, or if you wanna have like a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the admissions counselor, um, that's also really helpful for students to, you know, help them navigate the, the application process. But, um, you know, there could be other ways that you can also navigate, whether it's help from your guidance counselor at your school, or if you are working with an outside partner. I know with our services, we help a lot of clients or high school students, um, you know, keep up with the requirements needed for the application for whatever schools are looking into. Um, so whether it has to do with the college application or the financial um, application as well. Uh, so yeah, that's a big thing that I like to mention, you know, just checking in with the requirements that are needed from students um, and seeing when the deadlines are for those college applications and financial applications. Um, so, um, and then moving on to a next question I got, um, which is uh, an interesting one is what are, what are the differences between applying um, from private to Ivy League to public institutions? Um, I wouldn't say there's a big difference, but you know, they all flow in the same way. It might be that some schools might be needing additional um, you know, documents or requirements from students. So one of the things that I'm thinking about is the application like submission. So it could be that maybe some schools are using the Common App, other schools are using maybe the coalition app. Um, deadlines might be a little different. So um, it could be that the Ivy Leagues might have maybe like an earlier deadline, perhaps than some of the private or public institutions. Um, some schools may offer, you know, a variety of different application deadlines, such as like early decision or um, early action or regular decision, maybe rolling admission. Um, so there are a couple of things that could be different when it comes to the submission itself of the application. Um, additionally to that, sometimes the application or the college application um, can require students to do um, maybe perhaps or at least submit perhaps more more um, documents. So it could be maybe the student might need to write more of the writing supplements for a certain school. Um, it could be maybe the student needs to submit a standardized test as opposed to another school or um, transcripts or maybe a number of recommendations. Um, the list can go on, but you know, making sure you check in with those deadlines is very, it's the key to really making sure you submit everything um, in the right manner. Um, along with, you know, um, if you're looking more on the financial aid side as well, um, it could be that certain schools might ask for um, the CSS profile from College Board. Um, that's another thing that students might forget, or, um, students and parents might forget that there are certain schools that might ask for that additional um, application submission. So um, definitely, again, to just keep up with the school's requirements and seeing what they may need for the student to submit. Um, and then um, one of the other questions I also got was what opportunities are available for Latinos? So in terms of opportunities, I think there are a lot of them. Um, not sure which specifically you're looking for in, in terms of opportunities, but there are scholarship opportunities. There are also like enrichment programs that students can look into. Um, I know for scholarships, there there's a whole bunch of um, scholarships out there and again that could also be tedious just going through multiple scholarships with students and parents um, but a couple that I'm thinking of are probably like the Hispanic Scholarship Fund that's one that I always recommend students to look into um, there's also the League of United Latin American Citizens um, that's another one that I tell students about um, if your student 
is looking more in the local side of scholarships, though. Um, they can look into more of Boston scholarships, so maybe like the Edwards, City of Boston, um, maybe in the New England area, so the Stevens um, Phillips scholarship as well. Those are other um, sorts of scholarships that students can look into. Um, and definitely, um, I can provide those scholarship links um, later on in the chat. Um, if I have time to do that. Um, and then in terms of enrichment programs, um, if you're thinking locally, um, so if you're in the Boston area, um, I believe it's pronounced Sociedad Latina. Um, that's an enrichment program that I've seen a lot of students look into um, if uh, they are, you know, needing to develop, you know, their professional skills or looking to get more access um, with the college process. Um, and then other so often um, groups I'm thinking of is maybe like MGH Youth Scholars, if you are thinking about that science route, or maybe um, um, thinking of doing a career in that as well. Uh, but yeah. Um, uh, and then the last question I got was, where should I go for help with financial aid or other methods of funding my child's education? Um, so I'll try to touch up a little bit on that. Um, but like I like I was mentioning, you know, with the financial aid, um, you know, I think definitely look into partners that can help you, um, you know, review that financial aid part um, if you are confused about it. I know with our services, we definitely help a lot of parents and families um, and students look into the financial aid aspect um, and seeing, you know, what might be the most appropriate step for them. Oh, sorry, I think my time is up. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm, I'm like ranting on. <laughs> I could go on okay. with all this. We, we can, we'll come back to you later. I know we'll have okay. <laughs> questions. So thank you so much. Okay. And I, I you know, I think I'm really going to go out of order. So Jonathan, I'm going to save you for last because <laughs> <laughs> everyone wants to know about financial aid. But before that, I want to go to Ms. Lindsay, who talks, who can talk about a program that covers a number of these different topics that we've talked about so far, including financial aid, but also location and public and private and other stuff. So, please, Lindsay. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, you know, so one question that we've um, had is, are there different types of financial aid based on the type of school and maybe on the type of program that you're planning to study or where you're from? Um, in terms of what state you live in. So there is actually a program that uh, blends or addresses all of those. It's called um, Within New England, the Regional Student Program. And so that program helps students that live in the six New England states access um, degree programs out of state at reduced tuition. So that means, you know, if you live in Massachusetts, for example, you might, you could go to University of Connecticut and study pharmacy get a doctoral of pharmacy degree through this program and save significantly on your tuition bill. Save about uh, $13,000 a year in tuition at University of Connecticut for the pharmacy program. So there are hundreds of programs like that on all degree levels, associate, bachelor's and graduate that are available. And I can share the link um, to more information about it. So it is based on you know, where you live, what state you live in, uh, what program you're going to study, and the fact that you're going to a state college or university out of state within New England. And if you happen to be out living outside New England, um, there are programs like this elsewhere in the country. There are three other programs like it that are all based within a region of the country. And they're a little bit different than a typical uh, scholarship because they're actually a reduction on your tuition. Um, so they're not like a typical scholarship where you would have to apply for the scholarship. This program, um, you fill out your application for admission. And then once you're accepted and in that program, then you're going to be eligible to pay that reduced rate. Um, in terms of um, how to find out about financial aid generally and you know, about the different sources, um, someone asked about how do I find out about oppor funding opportunities from governments 
foundations, professional and trade organizations, universities, and private sources. Well, in terms of government programs, there are federal programs, there are state programs, and then sometimes there are city programs. So for the federal government, they have um, loans, low interest loans, they have grants, and they have what's called work study, which are funds that are awarded where students can earn up to a certain amount of money by working on the campus or for um, another nonprofit organization. Um, the states all have programs as well. And each state would have a website that would have information about their scholarship and grant programs. Like for Massachusetts, for example, it's the Office of Student Financial Aid. Um, so they would list all the um, grants and scholarships that you might be eligible for, that your student might be eligible for. Um, in terms of um, the college's financial aid programs, scholarships and grants, they would have information on that within their financial aid office. Um, and then to do a broader search, there are a lot of scholarship directories available. There are um, scholarship directories online. Um, for example, the College Board's uh, website, Big Future, they have a scholarship search. There's another organization, uh, fastweb.com, that has um, a database of scholarships that you can search. And then if you prefer to look at print directories, there are print directories that you could access in your local public library. Your high school guidance office should also have that information. Um, and then there are private companies that also will help with tuition, and that is something that you could investigate locally. Your high school guidance offices may know about local opportunities um, through nonprofit organizations or foundations. Uh, another question that came up was, does my child need to declare a major right away, and how do I help them decide? Um, well, it's true that they do not need to declare a major right away. Um, a lot of students do enter college as undecided. Um, and then during the freshman year, they may um, choose a major. And then the sophomore year, start taking the courses that are required for that major. But it's not unusual for students to change their major um, when they're in college because they're not sure perhaps what, they're, what they want to study. Um, early on, it's not a bad idea for them to encourage your, your child to maybe talk to someone who's in a career that they might be interested in and ask them, you know, what was their path to get to their career. Um, it may not have been a direct path and the major they studied might not have been precisely in that area that they're now working in. Um, but that could be helpful um, for them to learn about the various paths that students um, that people have taken to get to their careers. Uh, maybe they started at a community college and then they transferred to a four-year college, got their bachelor's degree, and then maybe they went on to get a graduate degree eventually. Or maybe they stopped after their um, associate degree. So there are many different paths um, to the types of education that someone can access beyond high school. You know, some, some people may just get a certificate initially and start working and then later on um, continue on with their education. And then in terms of how can you help your, your child in their college search, um, I think we've talked about that a little bit already, that there are many resources available and there are free resources. There's no reason to feel like you need to pay um, to have someone help your, your student or help you advise your student about opportunities for college and for financial aid. So I think we will be sharing with you a lot of uh, resources, online resources and uh, print resources and names of groups that can, that can help you. <clears throat> That I think I will start there for now and then happy to answer questions. Okay, thank you. And last but not least, <laughs> Mr. Jonathan Hughes, who is going to talk to you about financial aid. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, 
Yeah, I, so my name is Jonathan Hughes. I come from MIFA, which is the Massachusetts Educational Financing Authority. So, you know, we, we the first few speakers you heard from spoke primarily about admissions. And that, so I think about this as a kind of two-step process. One is admissions, your applications for admissions and, and getting into college. And the second one is financial aid and how you're going to pay for college. And so I know that there's a lot of anxiety around both of those uh, topics. But, um, you know, at MIFA, we really um, concentrate mostly on the finances. So I'm very happy to talk to you about how families do pay for college. And, you know, for as long as I've worked at MIFA, which is a long time, I've talked to probably thousands of parents and students, and they all have all sorts of questions regarding how they can pay for college. But it really does boil down to this question that sometimes people just ask outright, which is, how do other people do this? How do people do this? So how do I pay for college? Um, and so that is a, a, a totally reasonable question because nobody knows about anything about this process until they get there. But I do want to emphasize too, and this is something that Stephen sort of brought up in, in his um, talk at the beginning, which is, um, you know, it's reasonable to ask about how people do it, but how other people do it isn't necessarily how you should do it. And you should sort of go through the path that is going to be right for you. But I thought what I'd do is just talk in general about, because I get some questions about the, the timeline and the overall process of financial aid. So I want to talk about that. Now, the earliest things that you can do to start securing financial aid and to start paying for college is apply for scholarships. And you can start looking for scholarships as early as uh, well, I think middle school now. I used to say as early as um, freshman year in high school, but um, but you can go and and look and for for scholarships, we recommend a two track approach. So there are local scholarships and there are national scholarships. For local scholarships, we encourage students to talk to their high school guidance counselors. They usually are the best resources on local businesses, local organizations um, that have scholarships for students. For national scholarships, there are um, scholarship search engines that you can use. Um, you should never pay to have a scholarship search done. Uh, there are plenty of reputable free scholarship search engines. Um, Wendy, you just heard listed fastweb.com. I would add to that uh, a place called bold.org, goingmerry.com are good resources. We link to some on mifa.org. And um, just to second something else that a lot of people have said, we are one of those free resources. There are a lot of free resources available for you to use throughout this long and sort of overwhelming process that it's going to, to be at certain times. So please avail yourself of those free resources. Um, that's something that we say all the time, and, and you can, you've heard it all the time already in this, uh, but, but please do it. Reach out to the free resources. Um, so that's the earliest thing that you can do. When you start to get to your junior year, as, as Talia was saying, and the um, students are going to start looking at different colleges that they're going to be applying to, consider affordability. Um, so have a range of colleges with sticker prices that are high maybe and sticker prices that are lower, that, that might be more manageable. Um, however, um, as was said, again, you shouldn't take colleges with high sticker prices off of your list because you think you can't afford it. Um, there is financial aid available. There's a lot of financial aid available in general. In the, in the last year that we have data for, I think it was something like 184 billion dollars in financial aid was granted. And it's been in the 180 something billion dollar um, a year range at, at, over the past 10 years or so. So what is understood and what is causing a lot of anxiety for parents is that they think that college is expensive and sometimes college can be expensive because you see those high sticker prices. But what isn't as well understood is how much financial aid is available. So how do you get financial aid? Well, in the senior year of uh, in your student senior year you can start you start filing your financial aid forms and one has been mentioned already it's called a fafsa and it stands for free application for federal student aid you're going to want to file that and send that to every college that your student is applying to that's how you get aid from the federal government it's how you get aid from the state government and oftentimes it's how you get aid from the college and university itself in addition and this is the second really important thing that, that if you don't remember anything else, remember this. Um, 
you want to make sure when you're compiling your list, when you're looking at your colleges, you check not only when the admissions applications need to be in, but when the financial aid applications have to be in. So you want to see they're going to get a FAFSA. So what what is the date that which you have to submit that FAFSA on? And then secondly, they, they may ask for additional forms, the most common of which is called a CSS profile. And so just make sure you know what the college is requesting in terms of forms, what they want and when they want it by. The reason is colleges will have deadlines. And if you miss a deadline at a college, you shouldn't expect to get any financial aid from that college. Um, so you definitely don't want to do that. So you want to file your FAFSA, send it to every college. If a college requires a CSS profile, you want to send that as well um, by, by, by the the college deadlines. Um, and then, you know, depending, you, you can be applying regular decision, you can be applying early or early action. Um, they might have different deadlines, but just make sure you don't miss any deadlines at the college when you're filing your, your financial aid form. And so what that does, what those forms do is they take a look at your finances as a family. So they'll look at your, your income as parents, they'll look at student income if there is any, they'll look at assets of the parent, They'll look at any student assets if there are any, and they will put that all through a formula and determine how much financial aid you're going to be eligible for. Um, so that can be a nerve wracking process. That is actually what I should say is that that determines how much need based financial aid that you're eligible for. And so what that means is there's two ways that they award financial aid. One is need based. So it's based on your finances and how much you can afford to to pay according to the formula. And the second way is merit. Um, so this is not based on family finances, but it's in recognition of, of something that the student has done, a student achievement. So you think about merit aid, you think about things like academic scholarships or athletic scholarships. So these are things that are in recognition, once again, of student achievement. So there's two different ways that financial aid can be awarded. Your financial aid forms only assess your need-based financial aid eligibility. Most of the time, these, the, the merit-based, the academic scholarships, these come from the colleges and universities themselves. And so um, every college has a, a, has a different practice. Um, some colleges give out a lot of merit scholarship. Some colleges don't give out any merit scholarship. It really just depends on the college. And it's a question that you can ask the college if they give out merit aid. Um, I will say one other thing, because that, that, that brings to mind um, another thing that we talk about a lot, which is if you're not sure, reach out to the financial aid office. And so this is a good thing to remember throughout this entire process when you're filing your financial aid forms and when you're um, sort of exploring colleges. If you have questions about paying for college and, and how colleges will view certain things, reach out to the financial aid office and ask. Um, it can be scary to do. It can be a little intimidating to reach out, especially if it has to do with maybe messy circumstances in your life, if there's a divorce, if there's a job loss, and, and you know, it's not something that you are comfortable talking about, but it's something that colleges want to know. They can make adjustments based on your actual circumstances, and, um, and, but they won't do that if they, if they don't know. So reach out to the college, find a friend in the financial aid office, uh, get these conversations going. They, they are there as a resource to help you. Um, let me see here. And then so I think that's that, that can be it for my spiel. I want to see if there are any questions that I didn't get to. So um, how do I find scholarships that fit our needs? I think we discussed that. Um, we discussed the timeline and financial aid process. Um, the different forms that you need to file. Oh, somebody, yeah, okay, so this is a good question. Um, what are my chances of getting financial aid if we're not at poverty level, but also don't make enough to outright pay? Are loans my only option? Okay, so this is good uh, because this is something that a lot of people worry about. Uh, there is financial aid available for almost every family. The vast majority of families are eligible for some kind of financial aid. Uh, a good way to know whether or not uh, well, how much financial aid you may be eligible for. There are programs called EFC calculators, and it's something that you can, it'll take a few minutes. You put in some basic family information, income, assets, household size, et cetera, and it'll give you how much the, the formula feels that you can afford to pay. And so that'll give you an idea of your eligibility. 
Um, if you have specific colleges in mind, there's a, every college is required to have a net price calculator on their website. So if you say, all right, I want to go to Harvard. So how much is Harvard going to cost for me for a year? You can visit the Harvard website and, and do their net price calculator. And what that will do is it'll give you an estimate based on the information that you put in of how much financial aid you're going to get for that college and then how much uh, a year of Harvard is going to be for you. And as I said, every college is required to have one of those uh, on their website. So I think that's a great tool that you can use to estimate. Um, and then as far as loans are concerned, we can talk more about this later if you want, but, um, you know, I, I would just like to say maximize everything before you get to loans. So maximize your financial aid, apply for scholarships, use any savings that you may have. Colleges have a monthly payment plan that you can, you know, pay whatever you can on a monthly basis. Um, you know, most people, of course, cannot pay the full balance before getting to loans, but it is worth it to pay what you can before you start to borrow. The fact is, is that many, if not most families are going to be borrowing something to get through college. Um, the, the, the problem really is when people borrow more than they can afford to pay back. And this goes to, to what Stephen was saying earlier, which is when people say, how do people do this? And they know somebody who borrowed their entire way to go through college and they think, oh, well, that's what people do. So that, that's what you do and I'll do it. Um, without really thinking of how that's going to, uh, uh, you know, what position that's going to put them in after college. Um, so you really do want to maximize everything before you get to borrowing. And that's, that's where I'll leave it. Thank you. Um, talking about scholarships, I remember a young woman um, when I was working at Harvard Medical School who funded her college education and part of her med school application uh, her med school uh, time completely by getting scholarships. She made it her part-time job. Um, she was a full-time student, but she was also a part-time scholarship applicant, applicant. And she said she applied to 20, 30, 40 scholarships a year. Um, even if she didn't quite meet all of the requirements, she would try it anyway. And um, the more applications she submitted, the easier it got for her to do that. She, be, she got to kind of get used to the kinds of questions that were typically asked. Um, she had already answered similar questions and could use those as a basis to answer the questions for other scholarships. It can take time, but it's, it's definitely worth it um, to apply. You might get it, you might not, but you won't get it if you don't apply. So that's something for you to encourage your, your student to do. Um, I know we had some questions in the Q&A. It looks like they've been answered so far. We hope you have others. We still have some time with you. So if you have any questions, please type them in and we'll see if we can answer them. Meanwhile, are there any other, I know each of you had about 10 minutes. And maybe there's something you want to add now that everyone has spoken. Does anyone want to add anything? Yeah, I was just uh, wanted to add something on this fantastic information on the financial aid. Uh, just a couple of additional notes to add. Um, number one, as a family, when you were looking at different schools, really, really important to understand the, the two terms that get thrown around. One is tuition and the other is cost of attendance. Mm -hmm. um, and so tuition is... Uh, oftentimes people conflate, conflate the two and tuition is really just what you pay to attend classes. So it's basically your registration fee in order to take your, take your courses. But obviously, particularly if you're in a residential school environment, you're going to have a lot of other expenses as well. But even if you're a commuter student, you're still going to have books, you're still going to have meals, you're still going to have transportation, oftentimes student fees, all different kinds of things in addition to dorm fees, meal plans, all those kinds of things for residential schools. So um, when a school says a cost of attendance, generally what they're trying to do is anticipate 
everything that you're having to spend um, versus just what it would pay, you know, what you would pay to go to class. So oftentimes some of the reasons that a lot of uh, independent or private schools look more expensive is because they're actually quoting you cost of attendance, whereas a public institution may more often be quoting just the tuition. So it's always important to remember, um, and even when we throw around terms like a tuition waiver or we'll, you know, reduce your tuition by X amount, there's still all those other expenses on top of that. So um, it's oftentimes not Apple to apples when you're looking at costs and those uh, that differentiation is really important um, to understand and um, the other thing tying the financial aid back to the admissions question as well uh, there are also two different types of institutions out there one is called a need blind institution and the other is a need aware and so schools will uh, a need aware institution is a school that will look at whether or not you are going to need financial aid and perhaps how much financial aid you might need as a condition of your admission. Basically what's gonna happen in that situation is that these are uh, generally both tend to be schools that want to be able to offer you 100% of whatever your family's demonstrated need is. So that need-based financial aid that Jonathan was talking about. So they want to meet that commitment, but they don't want to admit you if they can't meet that commitment. So that's what need aware means. Need blind are the lucky few institutions that have deep enough pockets that they can meet 100% of your demonstrated need without considering how much money you're going to need. So um, those institutions are unfortunately few and far between, um, and they do tend to be some of the more highly selective institutions, but the schools that can guarantee to meet 100% of your demonstrated need um, and are also need blind, uh, that takes a lot of that pressure, uh, the financial aid off, um, off of a family. But again, they also tend to be very highly selective. So you wanna make sure that you're not just banking on, on that as your only possibility. Thank you. Okay. okay, we have a few questions in the Q&A. Um, the first one is, is there scholarship is there a scholarship for someone who's returning to school? Anyone want to take that? Um, I, it, it's hard to say what, to, to, to pick one element to say, is there a scholarship for this? Um, because I think there's a scholarship for, for so many different things. Um, so I don't assume that, um, when you say returning to school, I don't know if it's a, a short absence or if it's a, an adult um, learner going, going back to school. But um, as far as scholarships are concerned, you know, one of the things that, um, that I like to think about is that the, the, a lot of scholarships come from the colleges and universities themselves. So just by filing your financial aid forms, you're, you're sort of uh, doing that. In addition, some colleges may want, uh, may have specific scholarship programs that you need to apply separately for. So that's something that you want to check out um, on the on the college financial aid site. Um, secondly, the 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 um, stipulations are going to be different from everyone who's sort of offering scholarships. So it's one of those things where I would go to um, one of those scholarship search engines that I was talking about and create a profile. And what they'll do is they'll filter your scholarship opportunities based on the, the profile that you create. So a returning student may yield um, some specific results. That's probably the best that, that I could do, but I don't know if anybody else has any other information on that. Anyone else? Okay. Yeah, that's probably the best way. Um, those, those sites will ask you, as Jonathan said, to create a profile and you can put in whether you want to be um, close to home, like it, you want to look at Massachusetts schools or schools in any part of the country, um, whether you have any particular interests or talents like music, there might be uh, scholarships for musicians or artists or um, people who knit or, I mean, any, you know, there are so many different kinds of scholarships out there. And so you put in your criteria, your particular criteria, and you see what comes up. Okay, how many schools would you recommend students apply to? Is 12 too many? Um, 
I can uh, start with this and if others have, have advice, um, by all means, jump in. I think, again, uh, one of the frustrating parts of, of this process, I think, for most people, uh, particularly when talking to admissions officers, I know, is that most of our answers usually begin with, well, it depends. Um, and uh, so it depends. Uh, this is, again, a very personalized process. So if you are interested in one school and it's open enrollment, or you can very clearly say that you are well above the published threshold that they have for uh, for admission, then there's no reason to apply to a bunch of other schools just for the sake of applying. Um, however, if you are looking at more of a list, you know, curating a list as we talked about in the beginning, uh, generally speaking, I my personal advice is anywhere between three and eight is usually a healthy kind of medium to, to think about. Uh, there are students that I know who have applied to 35 colleges, and I think that gets um to be a lot it's it's a lot of applications it's a lot of application fees most importantly and it probably just means that the student hasn't really done enough to focus their interests again it's it's not really about um you know quantity in terms of how many schools you're applying to it's the quality number one again you want to focus on those schools that are a good fit think about at least that one anchor school on your list and then as you're thinking about maybe a few reach schools in there a few dream schools whatever you might want to call them uh, those are great things to have in there but going too much beyond eight or maybe maybe ten uh, starts to get to be a lot and again you want to remember that most schools are going to have um, application fees and while there are fee waivers available through a lot of sources which i highly encourage people to seek out because they can save you quite a bit of money they are often limited so they will uh, sometimes only give you uh, five schools, eight schools, 10 schools, whatever it might be, uh, but sooner or later you will run out of those as well. So I think, again, personal choice, uh, there aren't really rights and wrongs necessarily, but uh, my, my general advice to people is somewhere between three and eight if you're looking at a variety of schools. What's the typical cost for applications nowadays? Is it $75 each? For a lot of independent schools, it can be seventy-five to eighty-five dollars. Some schools, it can be as low as twenty-five, thirty-five dollars. Um, but uh, it, it'll depend again on the, the the institution. But a lot of the common app schools are um, up around the eighty-dollar mark. So, Natalia, do you offer fee waivers through your through Mass Ed Co? Yes, we do offer fee waivers. Um, however, they do the, cl the client would need to meet a certain um, income requirement to be qualified for it. Okay, so they would make an appointment and come in and meet Correct. with one of the other counselors and mm -hmm. figure out if they're eligible. Mm -hmm. And we also offer transfer fee waivers as well if the student is thinking about transferring um, to a different school. Okay, so not just from community college to a four-year, but from one college to another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I believe we also, um, our fee waivers also apply for graduate school as well. Okay, great. Um, we have a question. Oh, before we get to the next question, um, talking about fit, um, Mr. Abbott talked about fit and um, Hana Kalichi Kret, who is, I think you can see her on the screen, um, who works at the med school's son, went to Drexel University after visiting three times and thinking it was the place for him. And then found when he got there that it wasn't the right fit for him, the right fit, the right place. It just wasn't what he had hoped it would be. So he did transfer to a smaller college um, north of here and he loves to ski. And so he's up there with the cold and the snow, but he loves it. So, you know, even with research, you're not always going to find the right fit at first. And so transferring, as you mentioned, um, is an option when you, um, if a student finds that he or she is just not in the right college, um, you can apply to another college and transfer there. Um, it's not always easy. Uh, and some colleges really limit the number of transfer students they accept, but it is, it can be an option. Okay, the next question, SAT is optional this year. If taken, would that increase the chances to be admitted? Okay. 
Uh, again, I can just from an admission standpoint, I can offer um, a, a little bit of insight on this. I think it's a great question. It's a very important question. And uh, so there are schools that have been test optional all along. So I think the first thing I would say is number one, you do wanna uh, verify which schools you're actually looking at because uh, test optional is a school by school policy. So this past year, given the realities brought on by uh, the pandemic and quarantine, um, I believe every school in the country did ultimately go test optional, uh, but there will be schools that will be going back to requiring SATs and ACTs. And then there are schools that have been test optional all along. Um, so it will vary from school to school in terms of what their actual policy is. In, in terms of the test optional reality, uh, the important thing to remember for um, what test optional means is basically that it is, it is your choice whether or not to submit test scores, whether you've taken the test or not. So if you've taken the test and you wanna submit scores, you can. If you've taken the test and you don't wanna submit your scores, you don't have to. Um, and if you haven't taken the test, it doesn't mean you have to rush out and take it. Uh, the reality though, is the moment you choose to submit your scores, then that becomes part of your profile. So it is not an extra credit kind of thing. And I think that's a very good question because it's an easy thing to get confused about. And so if you have test scores, but they're not up to the standards or what a school might require or uh, something like that, um, then that, that won't necessarily work to your advantage. So it's not a clear yes or no that submitting scores will work to your advantage. It's um, again, it's entirely a personal decision. I always encourage uh, students to take a look at two, two questions really. One is, how did you feel about your scores? I mean, do you feel like they accurately reflect your abilities and your effort and everything else? Because if you took the SATs and really didn't have time to prepare for them, or you weren't feeling well, or you just really feel like those scores don't represent your best effort, then that's certainly something to consider uh, whether or not you want to submit those scores. And also take a look, most um, colleges and universities, again, some schools will have a very clearly published, you must have at minimum a 24 on an ACT or 500s on your um, SATs, whatever it might be in order to be admitted. Other schools will at least publish an average or um, an, an admit range. And so those can be helpful guides. Again, remember averages are always average. So it doesn't mean that you have to have that score. So looking at the range of students that are being admitted and their scores can be very helpful, but those can be two helpful guides in thinking about that. But uh, the short answer to your question is no. Um, you know, submitting scores is not uh, it is basically not like an extra credit kind of thing. It doesn't necessarily uh, work to your advantage, and it is ultimately a personal choice. Thank you. Um, I can oh. just add. Yeah, I'll just add briefly that um, there are a few schools that say they are test blind, so that means that they do not consider admissions tests at all in their admissions decisions. So, and schools would um, have that information available when you're applying. Um, there's also a website that lists all the schools that are test optional, and I'll share that um, in the link in the chat. Um, it's called fairtest.org. Thank you. Anyone wanna add anything else about anything we've covered? We don't. We don't have any questions right now. Anything you want to elaborate on? I, I, I do want to say something that we haven't really talked about yet, especially since we're talking to parents and, and um, that is, um, it has to do with loans. Um, and I say that as um, Mita is a loan lender. So it's something that's on the top of my mind, but um, the way we tend to talk about loans to pay for college, we talk about student loans a lot. So um, many people understandably assume that students can just borrow whatever they need to borrow in their own name without a co-applicant and just pay it back after they've, they've uh, finished with school. And that's just not typically the case. Um, there is one particular loan program that works that way and it's the Federal Direct Student Loan Program. It's, a, it's part of financial aid. It's when you do your financial aid applications, you get back a financial aid package and they will include those federal student loans. Those are really the only loan options for most undergraduate students that they can be approved for on their own without a co-applicant because there's no credit check to be approved. And they have um, loan limits that they can, so for freshmen, students can, can borrow $5,500 
in their own name without a co-applicant and, and, you know, begin to pay it back after, after they graduate or leave school. For sophomore year, that goes up to 6,500. For junior year, it goes up to 7,500 and so on. So, um, and that's part of the, your financial aid offer from the college. Any borrowing that, that, and one thing that we say, you should take those loans first. If you're gonna be borrowing anything, you take those loans first, they're the best options. They are financially because they've got all these sort of great incentives. There are forgiveness options. There are, um, you, you can manage the, the the payment a lot on those. You can bring, reduce the monthly payment to a, a certain percentage of your discretionary income every month and just make that your monthly payment. All sorts of things that aren't available with other types of loans. So, but once you take those loans and you still have a balance due after your financial aid package is, is taken into account and you may need to borrow for some or all of that balance, um, any loan that you get after those loans, they're all going to be based on credit and or credit and income together. So most students don't have the credit or the income to be approved for a loan without a co-applicant. And so oftentimes that means that the co-applicant is going to be a parent or, or another relative. It's not always the case, but, but usually. Um, and so, you know, for, again, over the years, that means I've, I've talked to a lot of our borrowers and, you know, people sometimes say, parents, well, I know it's, it's, I'm on the loan, but it's not really my loan. It's really her loan or it's really his loan. Or something. But, it, it, but, you know, you should understand that if you're a co-applicant on a loan, that's your loan. And you are you are um, liable to repay that loan. It's going to go in your credit report, and 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 you're going to be expected to pay that loan, um, especially if somebody else on the loan doesn't. And I mention all that just to, so you know, in you know that going it going in. Um, so credit score is going to be important by the time you get to or your, your your child gets to college, um, and then also, you know how much you're willing to borrow becomes important as well. So you wanna make sure uh, that you know what your monthly payments is going to be or have some idea of what your monthly payments for four years or, or you know, however many years it is um, uh, of education. And so you can estimate that and, and know, is this a monthly payment that I can handle? And if it isn't, and then you start thinking about what, what you may do about that. So, um, you know, do, do you need to increase an amount that you can pay out of pocket before you get to borrowing? Do you start looking at some uh, colleges that are less expensive, increase your scholarship uh, applications? Um, so just, just, I think it's a good thing to be aware of. Thank you. I want to go back since you, you um, we're still talking about financial aid. The FAFSA and the CSS profile, I remember them because it felt like they wanted to know everything about my life, everything. Um, and so when parents hit those forms and start to feel like, you know, they're opening themselves up to people who don't know them and this is, feels really personal, what do you say to them? How would you advise them? You're on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, um, so I, I would say that, um, first of all, I, I know that everybody's situation is a little bit different, so people might have complications to this, but in general, do the best that you can. Try to answer the questions as honestly and as accurately as you can. If there are things this is particular with the FAFSA as well. The FAFSA is a one size fits all form, goes to every college. They ask answer, they ask questions and they have specific answers. So, you know, for example, when they're looking this year at your income, they're going to be looking at the year 2020 for your, your income, how much you earned in 2020. Well, if a lot of people have lost jobs since 2020. Um, and so if your income is lower now, you still have to put that 2020 number on the FAFSA, but you have to reach out to the college and you have to tell them that it says this on the form, but this isn't really what it is. Um, be ready to document that. They can make changes based on that. So I would say just to, to, to be as honest and accurate as possible and to reach out to the financial aid office with any 
information that is not captured that is going to impact your ability to pay for college um, because they can often make adjustments to, to accommodate that. But it is, I mean, it's a very emotional process, you know, and, and it can be. So I, I don't want to, you know, downplay that. It can be difficult, but, but it is really, it is really worth it to seek out it's again, the help that's available and, to, and to, um, to talk to the right people because they are there to help you. Thank you. Sure. We have a few minutes left. Wendy, Talia, anything else you'd like to add? Um. I can add a little bit about our services at our planning center. So um, even though our physical location is at the Boston Planning, Boston Public Library, we are doing right now virtual one-on-one -on -one meetings with clients, whether they are students, you know, high school students, or, you know, maybe like adult learners going back into school. We help folks in those areas, um, whether it has to do with the college application or the FAFSA application. Um, so if you are interested in meeting with one of our advisors, we do have bilingual advisors as well. So um, if you are a Spanish speaker, a Chinese speaker, um, definitely um, come to our planning center if you are interested in speaking with someone. Thank you. And the, the link is in the chat, probably in the materials folks will get, but could you put the link in the chat, please? Thank you. Okay. Wendy, anything else about uh, NEBI or the regional program or anything else we've covered? I think I would just encourage people to, you know, check every re resource that's available, um, you know, including uh, resources that we have at the New England Board of Higher Education. We also have information on college planning resources and financial aid resources on our website, in addition to information about the regional student program. Um, the New England Board has also started to work with um, facilitating transfer from community colleges to independent colleges and universities in Massachusetts. So that's something to look at as well. Um, the idea is that the four-year colleges would accept the credits from community colleges when students are transferring so they don't lose ground with their studies. So that's, that's a new area that um, NEBI, the New England Board of Higher Education, has been involved with. And I can um, share the link to that information, too, in the chat. Thank you. Welcome. Holly, are we about? out of time or okay so i want to thank you all for joining us i want to thank my panelists very much for all of the excellent excellent information you've provided um and i hope uh parents that you will check out some of the other webinars that are coming up that holly has mentioned um, and right now i'm going to turn it back to you and thank you all so much. Thank you, Dr. Sanford Harris. And thank you to our panelists. It was a wonderful, wonderful panel, um, very informative. And to those of you who are joining us, thank you for taking time out of your Saturday morning um, to get some of this information. Um, we're happy you could be here. As a reminder, the webinar was recorded. So if there's anything you might've missed, you'll be able to go back and review um, at your leisure, as well as you'll be receiving uh, a large packet of supplemental documents that'll be sent to you um, by, the, by the end of the week and early Monday morning. So please keep an eye out for that. We, I am going to launch a short poll. It is very short, but we could use your um, feedback. Put that now. And as a reminder, um, the slide that just went up is the upcoming webinars. So you can register for them at bscp.org where you registered for this one. And we hope you can join us for some of the future panelists. So thank you again for joining us and we hope to see you back here um, later on in the month. Thank you. Thank you all.